Welcome to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding Love with me, Elizabeth Cunningham. Has the way that love has arisen in you seemed out of place or even taboo? My mission is to expand the conversation of love in the world. Is it possible to have deep, loving, healthy relationships? Have you ever been curious about having more than one relationship or partner at a time? Get ready to transform in love. Be courageous and set yourself free. In this show, we talk about relationships, sex, love, and the ways we wish we could be, but never thought were possible. I shed light on things that are not always talked about with conversations about expanding love. The Elizabeth Cunningham Show starts now. All right. Welcome to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding in Love. I'm your host, Elizabeth Cunningham. And today we are talking about a personal and professional dip inside of polyamory and non-monogamy. And I'm so excited to introduce our guest. But before I do that, um, a reminder that the show, Elizabeth Cunningham Show, is live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. on the Transformation Network Facebook page and is then aired on YouTube and podcast every Thursday. All links are in the show notes so you can find a new episode either live or pre-recorded every single week. I'm so, so, so happy to have you here. And on today's episode, we will be talking with Thomas Mundell uh, about his personal and professional experience in polyamory and non-monogamy. Thomas graduated from the University of Arizona with a PhD in neurolinguistic psychology. Thomas has dedicated his practice to walking with people as they discover how to use their emotional vocabulary. After all, the limits of our language are the limits of our world. So true. And in addition to his private practice, he is dedicated to being open and vulnerable about his own polyamorous relationships and experience, the comfy and uncomfy parts. He specializes in relationship dynamics dynamics, addiction recovery, and trauma. And he's super excited to share how all these things can quickly shape or misshape a relationship. Thank you so much for being here, Thomas. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh. It's been an absolute pleasure just creating this show with you. So I cannot wait for today's conversation. Tell me a little bit, why is it so important for you to share about your personal and professional experience in polyamory? I think it's important for people to understand that even a professional, uh, someone who walks people through this and draws maps for people, you know, through their relationships, um, you know, even we stumble, even we, you know, maybe don't read the room right even we you know go through you know breakups and polyamory and um it's uh and it's normal um kind of humanizing therapists um we sit there and kind of go oh you know here's all the solutions to you know all of your problems um and then people don't really see that like yeah i'm you know i personally have two therapists and i see them both once a week um and right. you know we are you know we're all in this together and i think that's what's important to uh really show people i could not agree more especially as someone who's i mean i'm so excited to have this conversation because you know i'm in the same boat i help people professionally in this arena and i also am personally you know dealing with stuff and i do i think it's so important to to humanize it and to also you know to have people know that there's no like perfect way there's no right way it's not like i have ascended and so therefore i am now sharing all of this with you <laughs> it's like no i'm actually i i am in the trenches with you <laughs> mm -hmm. and i just happen to have you know a lot of knowledge and information and tools mm -hmm. um and yeah and that healers have healers too mm -hmm. like i have so i have different healing practices as far as like I have my own coach I have a therapist I have my spirituality practices you know all of that stuff like there's so much stuff that I do as well to keep you know keep myself healthy too 
Um, and so, no, I think it's really, really important to, like you said, humanize um, even people who are very um, studied and professional and help other people do this as well. Mm-hmm. It helps the um, the patients or clients relate um, to whoever it is that's helping them. Um, you know, I have struggled with addiction myself. And so it's easier for people that are, you know, struggling currently with addiction to talk more freely with me because I've been there. I've been through the dark and came out the other side. And now I'm not afraid to go back into the dark because I know it's not going to hurt me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can go back into the dark and pull them out or guide them rather, um, you know, going to uh, an addiction counselor or therapist who's, you know, has never smoked pot before, um, you know, that might not resonate with somebody who is, you know, addicted to, uh, you know, different substances. Same with trauma. If you go to a trauma therapist and they're like, I've had nothing traumatic ever happened to me before ever, it's going to be really hard to open up to that person. Um, yeah. It's less like a peer. So when it comes to polyamory and relationship dynamics, um, there is a little bit more um, uh, personal testimony put into uh, the sessions uh, than you normally would in a therapeutic environment because it allows people to relate. So, and that's why I'm here. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of the string that I heard in all of what you said is, you know, there is a lot of shame in all these subjects, like there's shame in not having your relationships go well, there's shame in addiction, there's shame in, you know, trauma. And when you don't have someone who's also been there with you, there's almost like a fear of judgment. Mm -hmm. It's like, are you going to judge me? Like, even though you're a professional, you know, it can be really intimidating and just like, you don't know. And Mm -hmm. it's just like, Hey, I've been there with you. It's like, Oh, okay, good. You know, Mm -hmm. we're, we're both humans together. And I will say, um, it's uh, this is not to say that people who are not, you know, polyamorous or have never been addicted or never had trauma are not good at their jobs. Um, my <laughs> my uh, couples or throuples rather, uh, therapist um, is not polyamorous, but she's a badass at her job. <laughs> um, but uh, it does just take away that added step of, oh, you've been here, you know, you know what I'm going through, type of thing. Yeah, I hear that. Well, what do you notice um, uh, in like most often, like in your personal and professional life within polyamory? Like, where do you see the overlap for yourself? It's difficult for me to not be the therapist, <laughs> um, uh, to not be the the one to say, you know, I love you, but I love myself more. I'm going to step away from this situation. I will be back and we can address this when we have cooler heads. Mm -hmm. That's what I tell people to say in their (laughs) own words. Um, But it's really hard to do that and not sound condescending um, when you're having an argument or a work through with your partners. Um, And it's also really hard when you're going through something um, like full disclosure, like I'm going through right now, um, a breakup and a potential divorce um where i see you know i i zoom out and i see problems and i see how to repair those ruptures um but i can't be the one to uh, to you know say it to have them realize it or to you know tell them about themselves um because it's coming from you know an extremely biased uh party and so right. taking a step back in functioning relationships and dysfunctional relationships um, while still maintaining boundaries um, is one of the hardest things about being a therapist, but also being, you know, a partner. And so that's where uh, some of the struggles have been because I'm a professional listener and space holder, yet in my personal relationships, I get super defensive and um invalidating like it's my job to validate people and i get invalidating for some reason in um, relationships and i'm thankful for the past five weeks where this you know kind of turbulence is happening because Mm -hmm. i'm able to i've been able to sit with myself and look at how codependent the past 12 years have been Mm -hmm. um for me and i'm eight for me and my husband and I'm able to take a step back and go, whoa, I would love to heal these parts and then start again. 
I do not want to rekindle the relationship that was had. Um, I want to throw a stick of dynamite in that and then start over. It'll be a brand new relationship, brand new boundaries, communication styles, experiences, the whole nine yards. And that's kind of the goal that I have for my patients as well when they're going through a rough patch. Wow. Okay. So lots of gold in what you just <laughs> said. <laughs> um, and I, I think one of the first things is like the differentiation between, you know, being a therapist and I'm a coach. So like being a therapist and um, being a supportive partner and that you do have to like separate those two, you know, parts mm -hmm. of you. And just like you had to learn how to be a therapist, you know, you have to learn how to be a supportive partner mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. It's like, <laughs> that resonates so much with me. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, I like, oh my God, I'm so good at like helping people out with this. I'm like, oh, I actually have to learn how to be a supportive partner. That's a totally separate thing mm -hmm. to learn how to mm -hmm. do. Um, and then also you mentioned, um, you know, what you're going through personally and um and if you want to say more about kind of what's going on because i think that's also something that gets talked about in um polyamory and non-monogamy is exactly what you're going through like how do you deal with a breakup how do you deal with this circumstance you know mm -hmm. so if you'd like to share a little bit i know that you you got consent from all parties to to share today so i did i did yeah. um and so you know with that it's new relationship energy is um intoxicating um i mean biologically you've got your serotonin norepinephrine and you know dopamine and cortisol you know all you know pumping getting hits off of each other essentially um and i think when because i have grown up with an anxious attachment style and so the honeymoon phase that new relationship energy um i start over analyzing and uh, I step out of quickly um, and, you know, step into the, the realness of a relationship probably sooner than what is comfortable for, um, you know, for, for most who don't overanalyze things psychologically. Um, and so what happened was, um, and just the facts, not feelings, what happened is uh, my husband and I uh, have been together for 12 years. Um, we were married in 2014. And uh, we met, uh, we experienced infidelity on both parts. Um, I, when I found out about it, I was completely turned on. And then I was like, oh, that's weird. Uh, you know, that's not supposed to happen. Um, and so uh, ended up about a year and a half, two years ago, having the conversation, um, finally being vulnerable and secure enough to say, hey, you know, I have needs that I can't provide for you. Um, I would love to, you know, see you, you know, experience these, uh, these sexual needs um, because I was having um, uh, health issues and I couldn't, um, I don't know how explicit we get on this show. Um, as explicit as you want, go for perfect. it. Perfect. I couldn't bottom because uh, I had chronic fissures and so I would just bleed. Um, and so I have since had surgery to uh, repair that, which is, fantastic um but that was a need that i could not meet for my husband and it was a nice segue a nice excuse to have the conversation um and so we erotically opened up our our marriage um and so with that came me saying i you know i'm not interested in polyamory i only have the emotional capacity for one person and then we met um our partner or his partner whatever um and you know as soon as i left his house uh, after meeting him uh i called my husband and i was like you have to meet this person um you know we we're, we're gonna ask him on a date like it, it's happening and we did and it happened and you know three months later he was moving in um and started you know they both started remodeling physically remodeling our house nonstop hyper fixating um i and shut we're gonna down keep going past the past the break so i'm gonna keep your keep your story rolling so let's okay, just keep cool. going yeah keep on rolling. um i uh 
I shut down because my physical surroundings were changing. My, uh, you know, relationship dynamics were changing and I had never felt this before. And it was a shock to me to not be able to identify my feelings. I was like, whoa. Um, and so I reclused. I, you know, went back into old patterns of, you know, reclusiveness and not communicating, um, you know, our partner was an amazing communicator, amazing, and still is super vulnerable, gave me no reason to feel unsafe. Um, yet I felt like I had to guard myself. Um, and uh, that was not the authenticity that uh, he had felt at the beginning. Um, and while I do blame it on, you know, all the changes and adjustment periods happening, um it was me being insecure and still having an anxious attachment style um, and my codependency suddenly being shaken. Um, even though I had always said, oh, no, we're not codependent. We're just attached at the hip. Um, and, uh, you know, and then three days later, you know, because my husband feels safer um, with uh, with his partner. Uh, by comparison, since we have obviously had bumps in the road, um, there's a lot of trust issues, um, you know, between us. And it's up to both parties, um, you know, me and my husband, to put in the effort to repair. I'm a firm believer in rupture and repair. Um, and we can speak more on that uh, later, but that is the, I believe, the key to a relationship. Obviously, you need to love each other, but you can't bake cookies without you know, flour or some sort of substitute of flour. Um, you can have all the chocolate chips in the world, but it's not going to make a cookie. So if right. you have the ability to rupture, repair, you're golden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll say a little bit more about rupture and repair. Um, so with rupture and repair, I always say some uh, analogy about Japanese pottery being uh, broken and then uh, put back together. I was with that was my mm -hmm. that was literally my mental picture yep. <laughs> was just like oh yeah it's like oh my gosh I'm gonna forget the the name for that. Yep, I can't yeah. remember the name. Uh, yeah, but yeah, but when it's it breaks put together. They, yeah, put it mm -hmm. together with the gold. Yeah. And it becomes more valuable and it's more beautiful mm -hmm. and it has more character. Um, and so a willingness to forgive and not forgive in the sense of letting somebody off the hook, um, but forgiveness in the sense of letting go of the hope that the past can still happen differently um, is kind of the, the magic wand or the key to uh, relationships because relationships in and of themselves are triggering. They will always be triggering. They will always, you know, there will always be ruptures. And if there's a willingness for repair, there will always be repair. Sometimes if there's no willingness, if someone is just too tired, you know, both have to accept uh, the other's decisions to a certain extent. But, you know, I always ask people, exhaust all avenues. Don't go straight to uh divorce you know go to counseling you know talk to each other don't avoid each other um give yourself you know space especially in polyamorous relationships right now um the space isn't being given for repair because all time is being spent with uh with his partner um there's a, a pretty avoidant situation happening over here but we just started with our throuples therapist um you know, three weeks ago so we're uh kind of repairing that aspect of it so that we can get to the repairing us aspect of it. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, cause you know, I have never personally gone to thruples therapy. I've, you know, but like, how, how is that going? Like, how, um, what is that like to be a part of like a thruple in therapy? How does that go? It's uh well, since it's so new, um, uh, she, I love her method. She started with my husband, um, like one on one, and then she started with me one on one, and then uh, actually yesterday was our first um, session, just the two of us, and then we have another one Thursday, just the two of us, and then after that, we're gonna bring um, his partner in, my ex partner, 
uh, to kind of blend everything uh, together because there's no history there um, with uh, with his metamor. And so there's not a lot, there's nothing to repair. There's only things to repair between me and him. Right. And if that's a roadblock for my husband to be willing to repair, then we need to figure out, you know, is the partner willing to repair so that the husband is willing to repair as well? There's so many different facets. So we haven't had actual therapy with all three of us yet, but that's coming in two weeks. Yeah. Well, and I think that that's such a, uh, I love that method too, because there's so many different moving parts. You know, it's like when you were a thruple, it's not just like, okay, now you have one relationship altogether. It's like, well, now you have each relationship with the other one, you have the relationship together, you have, you know, and as you said, you know, you have different past dynamics um, between, you know, you and your husband and like, regardless of what the, you know, thruple situation is, there might be different past dynamics had, it, you know, if it's someone else, uh, some, some other thruple, uh, example. Um, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, like there's, there's a lot of different dynamics at play. And mm -hmm. so I do, I love that. I think that that's an incredible way to, to approach it and to look at it and to, you know, kind of almost like systematize it where it's like, okay, just one step, you know, absolutely absolutely and um you brought up uh you know each uh each party's uh relationship with each other um i've realized in all this time you know alone and all this self-work that i've been doing that um and his partner and i who was you know we were all three in a triad um him and i never dated it was always just the three of us um, they got their quality time by, you know, remodeling and doing, you know, you know, multiple rooms at a time. Um, and they were able to spend that quality time. I wanted quality time without distraction. Um, but uh, that was uh, resisted because it was taken as pulling them away from their quality time. And so there was kind of a push and pull there. And finally, I just, you know, let go and would, you know, disappear into, you know, our room. Um, and yeah. it was, uh, it, it was not handled well on, on my part, uh, because mm -hmm. I did stop communicating. I did, you know, uh, I probably inadvertently gave, uh, the, the silent treatment, um, or if someone, were to ask you know am i fine or am i okay i'd be like i'm fine I don't, i've banned that phrase in my practice from people <laughs> right. from saying i'm fine no fine is not a feeling right. um but i ended up saying it myself like and it was a it was a weird time but as soon as i adjusted that's when the net was dropped out from under me and so um it was all very abrupt and very sudden and unexpected um on my part um but there is a little bit of stubbornness um, that I've gotten past, uh, but stubbornness on their parts as well that they have, you know, admitted to, um, to letting go of the past or at least um, giving themselves a chance to understand what happened and why and to not take it personally. Mm -hmm. Well, and that can be really difficult to do as well. Mm -hmm. Or it's just like, you know, especially, you know, we've been talking more like kind of like this happened and this happened and this happened and looking at it more from like a factual standpoint where there is also like, there is the feeling standpoint, mm -hmm. you know, there is all of like the emotions and what goes on underneath the surface. And, mm -hmm. you know, as we said at the beginning of this episode, you know, you can understand it up and down, you know, right and left all day long, but at the end of the day, you're human with emotions. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And so talk to me a little bit more about like emotionally what it's been like for you. Emotionally, I had my uh, my week of like Julia Roberts ugly crying, um, like full on like bathroom floor moments as uh, like Glennon Doyle says. Um, and, um, you know, all these, you know, things that like it was some of the toughest emotions I've ever felt in my life. I flew up to my best friend's um, 
house uh, in Delaware. I live in Dallas, Texas. Um, I flew up to Delaware uh, by myself um, to stay with her on uh, Dover Air Force Base um, because I just needed to get away and give you know space and be somewhere where I felt supported um, and not you know in the house. We built a we literally built a bed frame. Um, and put a California King and a, a, a twin size or full size mattress um, next to it, squished them together. And we had like this big old, like, you know, fit six people on this bed. Um, and that bed suddenly felt really, 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 really small. Um, and so I, I now um, <laughs> live in the guest room. Um, it's been remodeled. But uh, I now live in the guest room and um, and then up here in my office are really the only places that I go mm. to a fault um, because I am <laughs> I'm the one that's supposed to make everybody comfortable. And so it's for my own comfort. Yes, um, because it is still hard to to see um because i haven't seen their grieving process um i've just seen their very goofy like happy go lucky still serotonin pumping out of their ears selves and i'm sitting here feeling alone like uh hello <laughs> like is anybody going to acknowledge this like you know earth shattering seemingly earth shattering event that you know just happened um but that was my codependency and that was me saying i want them to feel how i feel instead of feeling compersion um, and joy that they're feeling, you know, that my husband is, and, uh, you know, his partner is, they are open to repair now, um, you know, at least the counseling part um, and holding on to that and being expressing gratitude for that instead of, you know, saying you're not doing enough. Are they doing as much as I am? No. Um you know, was there a situation a few nights ago where my husband finally felt alone for the first time? We're both photographers too. We photographed a um, bachelor party for friends of mine that he'd never met. Um, so he felt very out of place. Um, and uh, his partner wasn't there. And so for the first time, he didn't have someone attached to his hip because I've, you know, an independent woman now. And, you know, I don't need to be um, attached to anybody's hip. Uh, but it was kind of an eye-opening thing for me to observe and for him to experience um, that yet yeah, maybe he has been distracting himself or the space has not been given or permission has not been given to himself to grieve or to feel alone and sit in that, uh, what Lennon Doyle calls the hot loneliness, um, because that's the that's how you inspire repair is is doing that and then surrounding yourself with you know on my end surrounding myself with supportive people um I, mean, I have a friend that i've known for about a year and a half and he has his name is anthony he's shown up for me in ways that i didn't even know i deserved or was worthy of yeah. um i have never had a male figure in my life i realized this like two weeks ago um and shared it with him. Uh, I've never had a male figure in my life where, without me asking, you know, made me feel like I'm worthy of being protected or defended mm -hmm. um, and cherished. And so, like, this is a whole new, like, you know, self realization of, oh, I don't always have to be the one to, you know, to to take care of you know someone emotionally i'm finally letting somebody take care of me and show me that hey you're worth defending um we went to an arts festival um and uh my husband and his partner you know showed up at that or at that arts festival um and uh anthony had his you know arm around me and just kind of like led me away like mid-sentence as they made you know their introductions uh you know my partner or his partner had never met anthony and kind of led me away and was like we're, we're going now and i was like oh my god and i went to look back he goes don't look back i was like 
okay. <laughs> um, but has shown up for me and I've shown up, been able to show up for him. There's some, you know, tough stuff that he's going through too. And that reciprocation is not something that I knew I deserved until now. So there's lots of really good things happening um, within myself yeah. that are going to allow me to be a better partner for my husband or for, you know, anyone after that or during that or, you know, on top of below of in between or whatever. Um, and it's really I'm now understanding what I tell people all the time, which is kind of a cool feeling. Yeah. Like you have to love yourself first before someone else can love you type of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Or the love that you're able to give yourself is correlated to the love you're able to receive mm -hmm. is how mm -hmm. I characterize it. I love um, that. I yeah. Love that. Yeah. It's just like if the love that, because giving is receiving, right? Mm -hmm. You give and you receive at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so if you're able to give yourself love, then that's correlate to the amount that you're able to receive from others. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I think that that's beautiful. And, and we are going to go on break here really quick, but mm -hmm. just to kind of recap, it is, it does take sometimes like these seemingly like, well, I won't say it that way. It does take things kind of exploding sometimes mm -hmm. to- Big fan of dynamite. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it does sometimes take that to really shake up your core, shake up your foundation and see like, okay, what isn't working here? And that might be with you, that might be with your partnership, that might be with multiple partnerships, you know, that might be just with like how you interact with the world in general. Mm -hmm. But it's like, sometimes it does, it takes that explosion. And of course, like, we don't wish each other, you know, harm on the other person. But it's also sometimes like looking at it from a bird's eye view, it's like, wow, it's there are some blessing in, blessings in disguise here. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited to continue this conversation. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about um, blessings in disguise and like what, <laughs> what you want to do moving forward and like, you know, what next actions are. And um, so we're going to cover all of that when we get back. Absolutely. All right, welcome back to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show. And we are here with Thomas Mundell. And we have been talking about the personal and professional side of polyamory. And specifically, we've been talking about, you know, since we are talking about you and your personal life and how that um, impacts your professional life as well and the, the overlap of those two things, you know, we've been talking about what you've been dealing with recently, which is a breakup, a potential divorce, you know, lots of feelings. And, you know, this is what we see when we, uh, you know, look at polyamory from more of a professional standpoint is, you know, I get a lot of questions about, well, what happens if my partner, you know, falls in love with someone and leaves me, you know, what, how, like, what do I do? Like, how will I be able to handle that? You know, and like most of the time, if people are speaking in hypotheticals, I'm like, you know what, that is a hypothetical and we're not going to deal with that right now. We're actually going to deal with what is in front of us, mm -hmm. but you're actually dealing with that right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for being so vulnerable. Then one of the things that's so interesting about how you're speaking about this is not only like the, the heartbreak of it and like the things that have been really tough to deal with and all of the things that you've noticed in yourself, you know, you've been talking about. Um, how you, you know, notice your codependency and notice your, you know, anxious attachment style come up, you know, all of these things, you know, you have all of the lingo. Um, <laughs> but like one of the things that's come up is like the good things that have happened out of this, mm -hmm. like, or, or I, I don't know if I want to use the word good, maybe you wouldn't use the word good, but like the blessings, you mm -hmm. know, what they're, what you can be grateful for in having this come up, which I think is so funny and I think that some people believe, you know, might think that that's a little bit callous even to say, um, but, but there's, but you started talking about like, oh, well, this is really good that this came up. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Like I said, um, before the break, big fan of dynamite um, and, you know, and those blessings in disguise uh, being being able to, like you said earlier, have a bird's eye view or to zoom out on, you know, 
initially it's where did it go wrong? You know, that's in a breakup. That's always where, you know, where it happens. Where did it go wrong? Um, but if you're able to look past the where did it go wrong, um, you're able to kind of get a more substantial, a more all-encompassing view. And you'll see all the places where it went right. And you can pluck those pieces out for your next relationship if that's you know what ends up happening um and you can take those hurt parts and i've always been of the belief that i will never make a partner a new partner pay for an old partner's mistakes i will never you know if there's one thing that i come out of this you know if it ends it'll you know it won't be jaded i don't believe in jaded love um and that, that guarded self um, as a defense mechanism rather than a coping mechanism. Um, I will always love hard, fast, and fully, um, no matter what, if I feel that with somebody. I'm not going to say, oh, I've felt this before, but you don't get to experience it because somebody else couldn't handle it or because I messed it up or because, you know, whatever. Something um, happened. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I will uh, probably in the future, um, you know, if uh, the cycle has to be, you know, repeated, we'll probably think twice about the the swiftness of uh, of going from, you know, brand new uh, relationship to nesting partner um, and uh, de-escalating a relationship uh, is something that is foreign to them um and it's foreign to me and the fact that i've never done it before but i help people do it you know professionally right. um but it is a lot harder when we have nine animals um we you have, have four nine dogs. animals <laughs> we have what? four dogs three cats and two chickens oh my god yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. you live on a in a domesticated farm Pretty much in the middle of Dallas, Fort Worth. Yeah. And uh, so it it does complicate things, but we are all, as of right now, um, still good. There's no like animosity. There's awkwardness. There's a lot of awkwardness. Um, We try our best to not have to walk on eggshells, but um, there's, we're all, you know, we don't, none of us hate each other. And I think that there's no contempt. Um, And I think that's what is important. There's trust issues. There's um, frustration that, you know, at the stubbornness of not, you know, giving repair a chance, but um, there's no contempt. Nobody hates each other. Nobody is trying to like sabotage each other. No, we don't see each other as competition. Um, You know, if, if what my husband has been feeling, if he's been feeling this for a long time, then this was just a catalyst and I can be, you know, catty and in moments of anger or just upsetness um and say oh you know he just you know if he's been feeling this the whole time he now just finally committed to it because he has a backup plan and then i'm like why it's not a backup plan that that goes against everything polyamory uh stands for Mm -hmm. um and so you know i have gone through those uh, moments of, uh, you know, I wish I had never introduced, you know, this, you know, this person and my marriage would still, you know, be intact. But then right. I step back immediately and go, gross. <laughs> how, how, like, how cynical is that? Because mm-hmm. this, you know, their relationship is beautiful. The relationship that we had for five months, all three of us was absolutely beautiful. Um, and why would I want to invalidate all of that or void that even by saying i wish this never happened no i'm so glad that it happened for sure oh my gosh i and well and it's beautiful and i think that you kind of hit where the like being a therapist and being a human kind of intersects where you can catch yourself in those Mm -hmm. moments you can see you can hold the space for you know the things that are going really well along with the things that aren't working Mm -hmm. or even along with the things that are heart-wrenching you know you Mm -hmm. can hold all of that space and it's a big space to hold but i think that that we i think that we we found the intersection you know Mm -hmm. 
is that even though you're still going through all of it, and that comes back to, I, I, there was a question I didn't ask um, mm -hmm. at, the, at the very beginning, um, which was something along the lines of, you know, how do you hold the space for, you know, having all of these heart-wrenching emotions and also still being happy for your partner, still having that compersion. And I'm so glad I didn't ask that then because it just came to this beautiful crescendo right there. <laughs> um, but that's really it is because, and I believe, and I don't know how you feel, I'm curious, um, <laughs> but I believe it's because you get a lot of practice. Like even right. though you're still a human, even though you're still dealing with all the things, you have so much practice and tools that you can catch it in the moment where you had that thought and you're like, oh my God, what a cynical thing to That's think. Great. Goosebumps all over my body. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. And I'll give you a short answer to the, you know, what do I do in those, you know, those really like tough moments. Um, I'm a singer and um, Alanis Morissette. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah, God. I recorded um, a cover of um, "You Ought to Know," and it's just yeah. Like I have, I had my my losing my voice to Alanis Morissette uh, era for about a week, um, but then when I, you know, in order to come back to that compersion, all I have to do is look at them, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, and then I'm like, okay, that's what matters. And then uh, Anthony, this um, guardian angel that's shown up. Um, he believes that music is the most therapeutic thing um, that exists, which it is. I agree. Um, I completely mm -hmm. agree. Oh my gosh. that That's a whole nother episode that I would totally do. Um, uh, all right. We are going to go on another break and oh, this has just been such a beautiful conversation. Thank <laughs> you so much for sharing everything. <laughs> um, and when we get back from the break, uh, we are going to wrap up. And we're also going to ask some wonderful questions. And then we're going to talk about what you actually do, because I'm sure that people want to get a hold of you. I'm sure that people have questions for you, interested in your practice. And so we'll get everybody that information as well. So we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Elizabeth Cunningham show, courageously expanding in love. And I cannot even I, to express how grateful I am to you sharing and really courageously expanding in love. Like you have absolutely exemplified um, the show's tagline <laughs> today. Um, so in, in everything that you've shared with us today, and we are, unfortunately, we're coming to the end of the show, mm -hmm. um, because I'm like, oh my gosh, I could talk about, you know, what you're <laughs> dealing with. And there was just so much that got brought up today that we could go mm -hmm. into. Um, <laughs> but from what you shared today, what are your current personal takeaways in your situation? My personal takeaways in this situation are I deserve more than what I was allowing myself to receive um, and not coming from a place of like conceit, but coming from a place of, um, you know, yes, putting myself first, but n not at the expense of others. Um, being able to show up for myself so that I may be able to show up for others, not just showing up for myself and only myself and the people that like bring me joy. Sometimes our partners don't bring us joy, but those are the moments that we need to show up for each other the most, I believe. And that's the biggest takeaway that I've had and the biggest realization um, I've had over the past five weeks is um, is is that um that i am my own best friend everything else is just a bonus type of thing Ooh. oh my god i'm so happy i asked that question <laughs> that was really beautiful thank you and of course. i i agree i think that you have to love yourself first i think that you have to be your own best friend it's one of my favorite questions to ask is if you were your own best friend what advice would you give yourself what would you tell yourself yeah mm -hmm. beautiful beautiful <laughs> okay, so we're going to do our end of the show questions, and then we're going to talk about what you do and how people can find you. Awesome. So what does love mean to you? 
Love means choosing to build a foundation next to someone else's foundation. Um, and then being able to use those two foundations as dance floors together. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I've been a professional dancer for 25 years. So that that answer has been in my back pocket for a very long time. And you're the first oh, person to ask me that. Yes! Mm -hmm. I'm so glad. <laughs> oh, yes. That feels so good. Mm -hmm. Captured. Captured right here. That was a beautiful <laughs> answer. I love that. Um, if people get nothing else, what do you hope that they got out of this episode? To know that the dark is sometimes there to be your friend um and that it's it's natural for us to be afraid of the dark those dark moments um and to want to avoid them but rather sit with them and look them in the face um because you'll end up looking at parts of yourself that have been screaming out for attention and you'll end up introducing yourself to basically a friend that's never left um and that would be yourself Foo, foo, foo. Yeah. Okay. Lots of sound bites for you. I know. <laughs> Woo! Dropping it at the end of. I mean, there's been a ton throughout the whole. <laughs> thing, but wow. What is an action that people can take? In what sense? Uh, what's it like? If someone were going through what you're going through, what do you think that they could do? What's an action they could take? they could go to therapy um <laughs> honestly yes. um, go to therapy <laughs> go to therapy uh, answer number one uh answer number two find if you can find someone to support you um don't go looking for somebody um be vulnerable in in how you're feeling on social media i know people would like to keep their you know private lives private but if you're hurting you know post something um saying hey is anyone able to hold space for me i'm going through a really rough time right now they will come they somebody will. somebody will show up for they you absolutely will mm -hmm. yes 100 percent. thank you thank you for sharing that because it's mm -hmm. so true there are people that want to and i'm just gonna say the royal you there are people that mm -hmm. want to help you they want to they're waiting they're mm -hmm. waiting for you to say i need you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh my gosh yeah <laughs> okay and what are you promoting today um well i have a podcast um with uh, a colleague of mine uh, and good friend and actually the bachelor party that i um uh that i photographed his name is dr johnson um it's called navigating chaos on all podcast platforms. Um, our first two episodes are Fear and Loving and Polyamory. Um, him and his soon-to-be husband are uh, polyamorous as well. Um, very, very loud about it, and we love it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, Navigating Chaos, a, a modern mental health podcast. Um, but then also my practice. Um, if people are interested, um, can find me at uh, soulbirdwellness.com um and, and that is name in the Sol show notes mm -hmm. and the silver name was uh, inspired by an india re song um silver rise mm -hmm. and uh it's the name of our bus that we you know we purchased a school bus and turned it into a tiny home rv thing and her name is silver and um Ooh. so yeah it's very it's a you could think of silver as like a butterfly maybe and so going mm -hmm. through that you know, that chrysalis and that metamorphosis. Um, right now I'm kind of coming out of that chrysalis um, and learning how to spread my wings, if you will. You are, and you're doing an amazing job. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for mm -hmm. being on the show today. Thank you for sharing so vulnerably and so openly. Thank you for giving a perspective as a professional, but also giving a perspective as someone who is actually dealing with this like raw and real right now. And it really does take a lot of courage and a lot of vulnerability to not only share everything that you did today, 
but live it and live it with such fierceness and grace and compassion for yourself and others. So thank you. Fierceness, something I tell people um, that I usually end with uh, on you know the podcast or whatever is uh, I want you to love yourself so fiercely that when you walk into a room, people see how it's done. Ah, uh, mm-hmm. holy mm-hmm. crap. Mm-hmm. I, I do not get credit for that. I think it was either Gabriel Bernstein or uh, whoever wrote You Are a Badass. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Jen, uh, Jen Sincero. Sincero, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, and but that quote is like, I want it tattooed on my face and I love it. Um, I also want to recommend a book to people that I know you've recommended <gasps> yes, before yes. by my friend Jessica Fern. This mm-hmm. helps a lot, you know, leaning Polysecure. into yeah, mm, Polysecure leaning by Jessica Fern. All of that. Yeah. So. Oh my God. Yes, absolutely. Cannot recommend that book enough. I do. I think I recommend that book on almost every single episode. <laughs> Like read Polly Secure by Jessica Fern. Mm-hmm. I've got five <laughs> copies right here next to me. I... Fantastic. Yeah, mm-hmm. beautiful. And then also um, listen to Thomas's podcast, Navigating Chaos. If Thomas is someone who really resonates with you and you're looking for a therapist um, in this arena, please reach out to him. Again, soulbirdwellness.com. All, everything that you need is in the show notes for this episode. Thomas, thank you so much for being on today. It's absolutely been a pleasure having you. And to everyone who is listening or watching, thank you so much. Thank you for your commitment to love. Thank you for being courageous. Thank you for being vulnerable. Tune in every Tuesday live on the Transformation Network Facebook page or catch the episodes on Thursday on YouTube or podcast format. This has been the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding in Love. Until next time, keep Mm -hmm. loving. You have been listening to The Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding Love with me, Elizabeth Cunningham. Tune in live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on TransformationTalkRadio.com, where we shed light on relationships, sex, love, and the ways we wish we could be, but never thought were possible. Learn to love yourself and create the relationships you want. Connect with me at elizabethannecunningham.com. That's elizabethannecunningham.com.